Hi. Hi. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I want to come on because uh, today I was uh, just thinking and reflecting on um, some of the issues that are popping up in our society today. Uh, a lot of this maladjusted behavior, uh, the criminality, uh, and just the overall antisocial personalities uh, that is stopping us from making the connections and uh, having the functionality of, uh, to be uh, well-adjusted and adaptable people, individuals in society. It's preventing us, uh, it's really blocking our interpersonal relationships and stopping us from making uh, long-lasting connections. And it's also uh, hindering us in our, uh, in our, in, uh, in, in work. Um, and this is also uh, uh, very prevalent among the LGBT community. Uh, we are very hindered and crippled in in our ability to keep, uh, obtain jobs and keep them, uh, and which has uh, brought on a lot of the financial difficulties. Uh, and there's a lot of high rates of homelessness among LGBT population. And I want, and then also started to think about what could be exacerbating this uh, this anomaly uh, in our in our lives. And I was thinking about uh, mental illnesses and disorders. Now, this is not a video to say that uh, LGBT people are has suffering this way be due to a mental ailment, but I wanted to elucidate and just make a discussion because I've done some reading on uh, sort of anti-personality disorder, uh, and that is going to bring me to this discussion today uh, of a book that I read a couple years ago. It was called The Mass of Sanity uh, by Hervey Clicky. Hervey Clicky. Uh, this book is uh, predominantly on uh, different forms of psychopathy. Uh, people who are experiencing psychopathic ideations, uh, manifestations of this disorder. Um, and I'm not saying LGBT people, uh, people who are suffering from uh, chronic drinking and and constantly being locked up uh, and incarcerated could be psychopathic. But it's something to look into if you're wondering or if you are a person who's look from the, looking from the from the outside in trying to understand this type of bizarre behavior um, that is so prevalent in our in our culture. Uh, I feel like that a lot of uh, gay people's uh, personalities have been masked or, or, or has been hidden under the guise of, it's just, it's just how we are and we, we are unique. Uh, and I think that this is an overgeneralization and I think a lot of these personality traits need to be further investigated. So I'm going to do that today. And and this is I'm not a uh, a psychologist myself. Uh, I'm just a person who cares a lot about the mind and how it works uh, because I'm also a person who struggle or who have uh, witnessed some of this this traits in my own personality, which. Uh, kind of guided me to finding this book. Uh, I find it to be profoundly helpful to understanding myself. Uh, so I want to kind of brush through this book a little bit. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on trying to just get every all the information out of it, but uh, you can go out and I highly recommend you buy this book. It's called The Mark, The Mask of Sanity. But, but first I start, before I start this book, uh, I just wanted to brush through the DSM-5 um, and it's a diagnostic manual for, uh, uh, and it gives a criteria on certain mental health disorders. Um, let's talk about personality disorder. So uh, uh, they have this acronym for personality disorder. It's MAD and all of these personalities are falling under this personality type. You have personalities that can be very mad, bad, and sad. And the personalities that fall under the mad category are the paranoid personalities, the schizoid personalities, and the schizoid, schizotypal personalities. 
uh, the bad or the, the bad personalities are the antisocial personalities, borderline personalities, histrionic personality and narcissistic personality. Uh, I spoke about narcissistic personalities, but I didn't want go into a lot of detail. So this is going to be uh, a video on trying to uh, go through this book, uh, this DSM-5, so you can understand what these traits are. And uh, lastly, you have sad. And these are people who are usually avoidant. They're usually very dependent, like in codependent relationships. Uh, they're obsessive compulsive. And so that's the traits for the sad. So mad, bad, and sad. And to go into more details of what a mad personality looks like. So we're going to start with the paranoid personality. So this is a cluster A of personality disorders. A person who is uh, paranoid is a person he has pervasive distrust and suspiciousness of others uh, such that their motives are interpreted as malevolent. Uh, they suspect without sufficient basis that others are exploit exploiting, harming, or deceiving him or her. They are preoccupied with unjustified doubts about the loyalty or trustworthiness of friends or associates. Uh, they are reluctant to confide in others because of unwarranted fear that the information will be used maliciously against them or her. They read, they read hidden demeaning or threatening meanings into be benign remarks of events. They perceive attacks on his or her character or reputation. And they have recurring suspicions without justification regarding uh, fidelity of spouses or sexual partners. Uh, that is the paranoid personality. The next one is the schizoid personality. They have pervasive patterns of detachment from social relations and a restricted range of expressions of emotions in interpersonal uh, settings, uh, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts. Uh, some of the criteria is they neither desire nor enjoy close relations, including being part of a family. They have almost always choose solidarity activities, uh, solitary activities like being alone. They have little, if any, interest in having sexual experiences with another person. They take, uh, they appear indifferent to the praise or criticism of others, and they show emotional coldness and detachment. I'm not going to go do each uh, uh, criteria uh, due to the time, and I want to really get through this information. Uh, but my job is to disseminate this information, and then you can go and do the research on this. But I highly recommend that you buy this book. So we're still under the cluster A's of personality disorder and under the mad category. So these people are normally just mad at the world and this could produce these uh, these symptoms in them. And the lastly is the schizotypal personality. They, they have cognitive or perceptual distortions uh, and eccentricities of behavior. They can have odd beliefs or magical thinking that includes behaviors and is inconsistent with uh, subcultural norms like superstitiousness, beliefs in clairvoyance, telepathy, or sixth sense. In children and adolescents, they have bizarre fantasies of preoccupations or preoccupations. They have odd thinkings and speech, suspiciousness or paranoid ideations. They have behavior or apparent appearance that is odd, eccentric, or peculiar. They have excessive social anxieties that does not diminish with familiarity and tends to be associated with paranoid fears rather than negative judgments about self. So that's cluster A. Paranoid personality, schizoid personality, and schizotypal personality. The next cluster is the cluster B. 
you have antisocial personalities. They have a pervasive pattern of disregard. So now they're bad now. Now this is when the personality has become bad. They have pervasive patterns of disregard for and violations of the rights of others. Failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behavior as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Their deceitfulness as indicated by repeatedly lying, use of aliases or cunning others for personal profit or pleasure the irritability and aggressiveness as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. They have consistent irresponsibilities uh, and they do not honor financial obligations. They have a lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent or, or rationalizing having hurt, mistreated or stolen from another person. The next personality is borderline personality. They have a pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image and effect and marked impulsive impulsivity. They have a frantic effort to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Identity disturbances are markedly and persistently unstable self-image or sense of self. They have an impulsivity in at least two areas that are potently self-damaging, either in spending, sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating, and this does not include suicidal or self-mutilated behavior. Uh, they have reoccurring suicidal behaviors, either in gestures or threats, affective instability due to a marked reactivity of mood. These moods include episodes, dysphoria, irritability, or anxiety, usually lasting a few hours and only rarely more than a few days. They have chronic feelings of emptiness, inappropriate intense anger, or difficulty uh, uh, controlling anger and they frequently display uh, hot tempers, constant anger, and reoccurring physical fights, inappropriate. And they have transient stress-related paranoid ideations or severe disassociative symptoms. And that is the borderline personality. The next personality under the cluster B of the bad personality is the histrionic personality disorder. They have a pervasive pattern of excessive emotional and attentive seeking, attention seeking. This begins in their ad early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts. Uh, the criteria goes as follows. Uh, it's uncomfortable in situations in which he or she is not the center of attention. They have interactions with others. Is often characterized by inappropriate sexually seductive or provocative behavior, displays rapidly shifting and shallow expressions of emotions, consistently uses physical appearance to draw attention to self, has a style of speech that is excessively uh, uh, impressionistic and lacking in detail, shows self-dramatizations, theatric, through uh, theatricalities and exaggerated expressions of emotion. And then lastly, considers relationships to be more intimate than they actually are. An example with this would be like, uh, they're constantly referring to the coffee shop employee as their first name or talking to them and trying to uh, be familiar with them when they're just, you know, taking their order. Uh, we're not friends. I'm just an employee. <laughs> or the employee might offer them a 10% discount uh, just to be nice one day. And then the next day, and somehow they've conjured up that this person is their, now their friend. <laughs> uh, the next personality under the bad 
cluster is the narcissistic. And this is something that is very prevalent in our society. They have a pervasive pattern of grandiosity and fantasy or behavior, need for admiration and lack of empathy. And this usually begins in early adulthood. Uh, the criteria under this have a grandiose sense of self-importance, uh, like in exaggerated achievements and talents. Like, oh, I went to graduate school at Columbia University, even though they only went for one semester. Uh, they expect to be recognized as superior without a commiserate achievement is preoccupied with fantasies of an unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. They believe that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should be associated with other special or high status people or institutions. They require excessive admiration, has a sense of entitlement, is interpersonally exploitive, they take advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. And they lack empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. Is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. And this can bring on a lot of competitive uh, competition within themselves. Uh, they could be competing with somebody on their own. And this could all just be uh, going on in their own mind that they're in competition with somebody when in reality, this person doesn't even know what, you know, are not competing with them. And lastly, they show arrogant or haughty behavior or attitudes. And this is under the bad. And that is in the third category, a cluster is the sad. And these people are very sad. This is cluster C. Avoidant personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of social inhibitions, feelings of inadequacy and hypersensitivity to negative e evaluations. And this is beginning in early adulthood. The criteria includes avoid occupational activities that involve uh, significant interpersonal contact because of fear of criticism, disapproval or rejection. Uh, is unwilling to get involved with people unless certain of being liked, shows restraint within intimate relationships because of fear of being shamed or ridiculed, is preoccupied with being criticized or rejected in social situations, is inhibited in new interpersonal situations because of the feelings of inadequacy, and views self as socially inept, personally unappealing, or inferior to others. And lastly, is unusually reluctant to take personal risks or to engage in any new activities because they may uh, prove embarrassing. And this is cluster C. The next personality under this cluster is dependent personality disorder. They have a pervasive and excessive need to be taken care of that leads to submissive and clinging behavior and fears of separation. And this is beginning in early adulthood. Uh, the criteria for this dependent personality is that they have difficulty making everyday decisions without an excessive amount of advice and reassurance from others. I'm not gonna go into the, all of them, but they have difficulty initiating projects or doing any doing things on his or own on his own or her own. So this becomes that because this is because of a lack of self-confidence and judgment of abilities rather than a lack of motivation or energy. They feel uncomfortable or helpless when alone because of exaggerated fears of being unable to care for him, himself or her herself. And lastly, urgently seeks another's relationship as a source of care and support when in a close relationship ends. So they're constantly getting into the next uh, bad relationship. Uh, I talk about these patterns, pathological patterns of jumping into these karmic relationships because uh, they don't want to be alone. These are people who are dependent. And the last personality under this personality type is the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. They have a per pervasive pattern of preoccupation 
with orderliness, perfectionism, and mental and interpersonal controls. The criteria is they are preoccupied with details, rules, lists, order, organization. They show perfectionisms that interferes with task completions. They're unable to complete a project because his or her own overly strict standards are not met. Is excessively devoted to work and productivity to the exclusion of leisure activities and friendships. And I'm gonna stop. Oh, and lastly, I'm gonna just read one more of this personality type. They adopt a miserably spending style toward both self and others. Money is viewed as something to be hoard, hoarded for future ca catastrophes. So that's the last. So these are, and if you want to know the list, it, I just wrote them down and you can write them down yourself. Uh, this is the personality types. We got mad, bad, and sad. I wrote down a couple of uh, cogn cognitive distortions. Uh, this is all falling under the personality uh, disorders. So types of cognitive, this is the way you think. Uh, distortions include filtering. This is focusing on the negative with exclusion, with excluding the positive. They're always focusing on the negative with no uh, appreciation of other possibilities. So everything is going is doomed to fail in their own mind. This is a cognitive distortion. This could really prevent you from starting new projects, uh, going into new relationships, getting new jobs. It hinders you in so many areas because it's dealing with the cognitions. Uh, that's why uh, dialogical behavioral therapy is very crucial for people who are suffering from cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive distortions. They have this black and white thinking. Uh, they think things are all good or either bad. So this makes them very inflexible. Uh, they have overgeneralizations. Uh, they exaggerate or take things to the extreme. They catastrophize things. The next one is mind reading. They make assumptions about what's going on, going to happen or what someone thinks. What you assume, what they assume someone is thinking is colored by our own issues. So that is a form of projection. So they'll project what they're really feeling. And but this is really a defense mechanism that they're employing. Uh, and this is called mind reading. Making these assumptions that are all just built up in their own minds. The next one is called emotional reading, reasoning. Emotional reasoning is believe emotions are based on truth and not facts. So they're going by their emotions and that's real to them without thinking rationally about the situation. This is emotional reasoning. This is all cognitive distortions. Uh, the next one is called should statements. They create unrealistic expectations. The next one is catastrophizing. They have health anxiety, panic attacks, afraid to be alone in case of some dizzy fainting spells. Or they may stop breathing and think of death. They assume negative outcomes. Uh, and this progresses, and this is a catastrophizing uh, cognitive distortion. And lastly, the uh, personalization. They think everything is about themselves. They think everything is about them. And this is a list of cognitive distortions if you want to know what they are. I see a lot of these types of personalities uh, in the general population, but I'm just going to focus on the LGBT uh, sector because I want uh, 
other LGBT people who are watching me, who watch me, who are subscribed to me to understand uh, where this, a lot of these things that they're noticing in, in their relationships and their partners. This is a, they, they, they are perceiving these things and they're not understanding that these are really uh, cognitive distortions. Um, this is why your relationships are not working out and why it creates all this friction and static. Uh, having knowledge helps you to be more compassionate to these people. So you will know you're dealing with a distorted and it's dealing with their cognitions. And it's hard for them to come out of it if it's being compounded with substances and they're not getting the psychotherapy that is going to help them unravel uh, these um, this wiring system that they have. Uh, there is a this is this is kind of tying into what a uh, personality dis, uh, disorders. Uh, they have an acronym called OCEAN. O C E A N. This is a uh, personality traits. The first trait is openness, uh, openness, safety, focus, low end. The low end of openness is cautious, anxiety to unfamiliar things, and on the high spectrum of openness is curious, enjoy, enjoy discomfort, and boredom stress, boredom stresses. I'm not, I'm just gonna give you this list. I'm not even going over it too much, but this is the acronym for these personality traits. So you have low end and high end. Low end will be where it becomes like maladaptive and then on the high end, it's more functional. So finally to this book, the Mask of Sanity by Herbie Clicky, MMD. So the word insane is not a medical term. However, the medical term psychotic presents a fair idea of the present conception of severe mental disorder. Some people may show to a certain degree the reactions of schizophrenia, of manic depressive psychosis, or of paranoia without being sufficiently disabled or generally irrational as to be recognized as psychotic. So he's saying that you can show to a degree uh, these reactions to schizophrenia and manic depressive psychosis, but it it's not sufficient enough to be uh, recognized as being labeled a psychotic. And this is the problem in our society because uh, this has become normalized, but we don't really know how to properly uh, recognize it and diagnose it uh, sufficiently. Uh, because it's just get meshed into the into the culture and our behaviors and stuff. Some patients pass through a preliminary phase during which their thought and behaviors are to a certain degree characteristics of the psychosis, while for the time being they remain able to function in the community. It is difficult, however and unfair to pronounce a person totally disabled while most of their conduct remains acceptable. So it is very difficult. Another factor worth mentioning is the psychopath's almost uniform, un is the psychopath's almost uniform unwillingness to apply like other illnesses, illness people, ill people for hospitaliza hospitalizations or for any other medical services. Those other ill persons who develop anxiety and phobias or psychosomatic manifestations are likely to seek aid from a physician. Even those whose symptoms can be classified as psychoneurotic can be persuaded by their families after varying periods of reluctance to ask for help. But this is not uh, uh, the case with psychopaths. Uh, they probably will never uh, seek treatment. It is true that a considerable small portion of prison inmates show, show indications of such disorder because the typical patient is not likely to commit major crimes that result in long prison terms. Though they regularly make trouble for society as well for himself, 
and is frequently handled by the police, his characteristic behavior does not include felonies, which would bring about permanent restrictions of his activities. So he's saying that psychopaths are typically not uh, getting locked up, uh, though they get uh, and being very mostly involved with police, with the police due to them breaking the law, they usually don't end up long term in prison. He is often arrested perhaps a hundred times or more, but he nearly always regained his freedom and returned to his old patterns of maladjustments. To get the feeling of the person whose behavior shows the disorder, it is necessary to feel something of his surroundings. So if you was a person who wanted to understand a psychopath or to try to observe and try to assess if they were psychopathic, you have to go into that person's environment in their surroundings uh, and watch the behavior and how they're interacting. It is true that nearly all psychopath psych psychiatric disorders uh, in, a, in a sense is in a sense, psychopathic, in that it affects adversely interpersonal relations. In most disorders, the manifestation of illnesses, such as depression, schizophrenia, hypomania, they can, these disorders can, however, be more readily demonstrated in an isolated patient in the setting of a clinical examination. But in contrast, it is but impossible to demonstrate any of the symptoms in the psychopath under similar circumstances. So what you can uh, uh, witness from a schizophrenic by having a, an engagement, say, say you're doing psychotherapy with a schizophrenic, uh, one uh, indication could be a lot of word salad and how they're speaking. They usually employ a lot of word salad in there. So this could be a criteria that could be checked off. But with the psychopath, uh, it's a little bit more vague and you cannot always uh, be able to isolate uh, or demonstrate what to look for when you're engaging with them in this same clinical setting. That is to say that the fundamental substance of the problem in that psychopath, real as it is in life, it will disappear or escape our specialized perception when we remove the patient from the milieu in which he is to function. So if we're taking him out of his environment, putting him in a clinical setting to observe him. It's just much more difficult to recognize uh, those symptoms. The disorder can be demonstrated only when the patient's activity meshes with the problems of ordinary living. Uh, it cannot be even remotely apprehended if we do not pay particular attention to his responses uh, in those interpersonal relations that to a normal man. Like work, paying bills, uh, his family and his love life. Uh, this is the only way that we can observe this being demonstrated. Uh, the, this, the problem is, is that in society, we live in a lot of, we live in a segregated society. So uh, people who live in the hood who are displaying these psychiatric disorders or who could be psychopathic, uh, it, the people within this cultural milieu are not seeing it as psychopathic. So it just runs amok in that culture. Uh, but if a per clinical person was to go into that, it, it could be they could easily identify these psychopathic traits. Uh, the problem is our psychologists, our social workers, are not spending enough time in these environments and doing a, uh, enough outreach to be able to observe this, so we can form some sort of clinical analysis and a solution to these problems. So in essence, I feel like that what are these social workers and these psychologists getting paid for if we're not really getting to the root cause? And they know that these psychiatric trait symptoms are in the, in this environment, but the people within that environment don't even recognize it in themselves, and the families are not recognizing it because they've been in it for the in it for so long. They're not seeing it as mal maladaptive. The schizophrenic can by his verbal communication give us some useful clues to our effort to approach many of his problems. 
Uh, but in the psychopath, little to nothing of this sort is reliable by an ordinary psychiatric examination can be obtained. Only when we observe him, not through his speech, but as he seeks to his aims in behavior and demonstrates his disability in interactions with the social group, can we begin to feel how genuine uh, his disorder is. The features that are most important in this disorder do not adequately emerge when it is relatively isolated. The qualities of the psychopath become manifest only when he is connected into the circuits of full social life. We must concern ourselves not only with their measurable intelligence, their symptomatology, their symptomatology or lack of symptomatology, but also with the impressions that they make as total organisms in action among others and all the nuances and complexities of their relations to uh, to see them properly in such a light, we must follow them from the hospital wards out into the marketplace, the saloons, the brothels, the churches, work or wherever else they uh, engage with in their environment. It is true that the psychopath engages in behavior so unlike that of others and so typical of his disorder that no act can be reported. Uh, Cliquey also says that he does not believe that obvious mistreatment or any simple, uh, uh, simple egregious parental error can be held justifiably as the regular cause of a child's developing this complex disorder. So this cannot be uh, attributed to any error in parental and the way he was raised in his childhood. As in the word salads of a schizophrenic, so in the behavior of the psychopath, there seems to work a positive knack for producing situations which can be accounted for only in terms of a psychiatric illness, which is very unique in them. So what I loved about this book, because this is a large book and you would think, uh, why would I want to read a book so... Uh, uh, exoteric in nature. It's hard to understand it. Uh, no, uh, most of these books, the rest of this book, after I've just kind of build it up into introductory uh, to get help you to understand uh, what a psychopath is uh, in terms of the clinical uh, definition, The pretty much the rest of the book is uh, dealing with case studies. Uh, these case studies of people that he either interviewed from within the institution of the psychiatric ward. Uh, these were also pa uh, patients who also had never been uh, uh, put inside of these in uh, mental institutions. He, he interviewed females and adolescents as well uh, in his clinical assessments and during his case studies very fascinating to go through this book. And I don't want to spend the rest of this book uh, discussing these case studies. My instincts are telling me not to waste any time doing that. I just want you to go out and get this book yourself uh, so you can find, uh, and there's no better way to recognize these traits in yourself uh, other than reading it and in other people who are suffering with this. And this is how I was able to understand that I carried some of these traits in myself uh, by looking at these case studies and seeing different things that they were doing and how they were always getting locked up and these aggressive gestures and drinking and, and chronic and vocal uproars and super convulsive Vulsions that lasted longer than 10 hours, uh, talks of spells and magical thinking. Uh, it was just, this is a fascinating book. Uh, the different delusions and unpro unprovoked attacks. Uh, he just goes on and on and, and, is, and he's interviewing females and males and they were mostly predominantly uh, Caucasians. Uh, but I think that they could be applicable to uh, any sector of the population. Um, so uh, don't think that you can't relate to this because the 
case studies were white people. Uh, we're all the human race and we're all dealing with these uh, disorders. So I want people to buy this book and read through these case studies and start being honest with yourself uh, that you could be possibly exhibiting some of these traits in yourself. But I just give you just kind of like an introduction of that book uh, with combination of the different personality trait, uh, character, uh, personality disorders, uh, as it is uh, listed in the DSM-5. Uh, and yeah, uh, that is just kind of what I was just thinking about this morning. So uh, I want you to take this information and do what you want to do with it, or just know that uh, we're never going to get to a solution until we're being honest with ourselves. So with that said, you guys have a wonderful day. And my computer froze and it doesn't want to get off this video. But 